the end of Friday's class, the question that I left you with is, we know that a twist, a T in the Rational Tangled Dance can be canceled on the right by RT, RT, R, right? By that, that combination. Um, and so the question that I left you with is, does it also work on the left? So if T composed on the right with R, T, R, T, R was equal to the empty tangle, Does it also work on the left side? And what was the consensus in the discussion here on Slack? What do you think? RT, RT, R happening on the left? Does it still work? Well, the Slack discussants seemed to say yes. Um, by the way, for those of you that participated in this discussion, it was a great discussion. Um, definitely count that this week for your experience points. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with that. I mean, we could, I, I could have brought down my cardboard tangle and we could have danced it out here, but um, I think the advantage, what's the advantage of trying to cancel on the left compared to the cancellations that we had to talk about last time, which were on the right? A couple people noticed that this was true, yeah. You're starting with an empty tangle. You're starting with an empty tangle at the beginning. And so right away, when you do R, T, R, that already, I think, gets you back to an empty tangle. Uh, and then this TRT, likewise, gets you another empty tangle. Because we're starting from empty, right? It was harder to know how to cancel the twist when the twist was already there and we had to keep doing stuff. When there's nothing there, when it's the beginning, RTR is an empty tangle, TRT is an empty tangle, as Ashley says right here. And so I agree that this same RTRTR that cancels a T when we put it on the right of it also cancels a T when we put it on the left. And so what we'll say, I want to introduce a little bit of terminology for the day, is we'll say that RT, RTR is, on the one hand, the left inverse, and let me call it the right inverse. So that was the one that we knew was true. It was the right inverse of T, right? Because when I place RT, RTR on the right of T, it cancels out that T and we get an empty tangle. But we also, argued, it's a left inverse of t. Because when I put it on the left of t, I also get an empty tangle. Right, so we can cancel t whether we're coming at it from the left side or whether we're coming at it from the right side. And so anytime we have an element which is both right inverse and left inverse, we'll just call it the inverse. We'll just, uh, let me not use the word the. <laughs> we'll just call it inverse. So when we don't specify left or right, implicitly we mean it's both the left inverse and the right inverse. Um, but what question haven't we answered? We don't know for sure whether there might be a different way of canceling t's besides rt, rt, r. Um, and that's a question that I don't want to answer right now um, because this is going to be one of, one of the burning questions that we want to keep burning uh, for the next couple of weeks. Because a big part of what we're trying to do, as you can probably tell, uh, is we're trying to leave behind some of the particulars that we've learned over the years make algebra work and try and abstract them away and figure out where does algebra come from aside from the numbers and addition and subtraction and multiplication and division that we're used to from the high school algebra curriculum. Where does algebra originate? Like what can we take for granted will exist in an algebraic system? And what's window dressing or what's, what's specific to the case of numbers and addition and subtraction? Um, what's underneath it all? And so always ask why, or always ask how do we know, or I'll always ask are we sure this still works? Those questions are going to be your friends, uh, particularly early on in the semester as we adjust to this new environment where there are much fewer rules, and yet there are still some rules. Um, so that's as much as I want to say about this. Um, the other question that I had posed at the end of Friday was, can you think of an example in mathematics of a left inverse that doesn't work as a right inverse, or vice versa? And so what was the, the, the tenor of that discussion? Where did people end up on that one? Because there was a couple of really good responses in the discussion. Where might left inverses not be right inverses? I get Matrices. Matrices. One of the reasons that linear algebra is a prerequisite for this course is it gives you that level of familiarity with working with matrices as mathematical objects. Right? And so can we think of an example of a matrix 
whose right inverse is not the same as its left inverse. Let me get a blank canvas here just so that we can, we can write. So what kinds of matrices can have left inverses that are not right inverses? What has to be true about them? This came out in the discussion. For a square matrix, um, when the determinant is 0, we know that the matrix is not invertible. When the determinant is non-zero, we know it has an inverse. And for a square matrix, an inverse which works on the right side of the matrix actually also works on the left side of the matrix. So for a square matrix, a left inverse and a right inverse are going to be the same. So if we're going to have an example where that's not the case, what kind of a matrix must it be? Not square. Not square right? If square <laughs> implies left and right inverses are equal, then if left and right inverses are not equal, that implies not square, contrapositive. So yeah, if we have a non-square matrix, it's not even clear what having an inverse is even supposed to mean. Right? Um, so here's an example of a non-square matrix. 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Right, let's call this A. So there's a matrix. It has more columns than it has rows. Um, if I want to cancel this matrix out somehow, Maybe I would want to multiply it by a matrix over here that gives me, what would be the matrix equivalent of the empty tangle? Like what are we supposed to get? If I were to cancel this matrix out, what's supposed to be left behind? The identity matrix. We'll talk more about why that is as the semester goes along, but yeah. So canceling out a matrix means leaving an identity matrix behind. Um, but this is not a square matrix, so we have to be careful about dimensions. All right, we've got two rows here and three columns. What size identity matrix do we want over on this side? Well, how many rows is this identity matrix going to definitely have? It's going to definitely have two rows, because whatever matrix I multiply by here, um, the, the product of these matrices is going to have two rows. But if it's an identity matrix, how many columns must it therefore have? Two, because every identity matrix is a square matrix. So that identity matrix is just going to look like this. Right? Um, OK. And so then what is the dimension of this matrix here in the middle have to be if I want the product to be 2 by 2? Three, 3 by 2, exactly. So that also means that the inverse of A, and by the way, when A is not a square matrix, I want to be super careful here. We call this a pseudo inverse. Great word for the day. Pseudo inverse of A. In fact, we would call it the right pseudo inverse. And it's going to be a rectangular matrix also. Right? Um, let's see if we can figure out how to make it, though. No, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so what I need here in the first column is something whose dot product with 1 minus 1, 0 is going to be equal to 1. Um, let's try just doing this. We'll see if we can make this work. Um, so now this first entry 1 is going to be 1 times 1 plus negative 1 times 0 plus 0 times 0. So that seems to work. Um, and then if I did the second row in the first column, I'd get 0 times 1 plus 1 times 0 plus 1 times 0. That's going to give me 0. OK, so this first column looks good. Uh, let's move to the second column. I need something which is orthogonal to this and whose dot product with that is equal to 1. Well, I think what fits that bill, 0, 0, 1. Let's check it. Uh, so 0 times 0, 1 times 0, 1 times, oh, whoops, that didn't quite work the way I want. Oh, yes, it does. That's the second row, second column. That gives me this 1. And then the first row, second column, 1 times 0, negative 1 times 0, 0 times 1, that gives me my 0. OK, cool. So we found a pseudo inverse of A, a right pseudo inverse of A. How do we know this is definitely not the left pseudo inverse of A? Well, maybe we don't automatically know. But let's try it. So what would I have to do to determine whether or not this is, in fact, a left pseudo inverse of A? Multiply. Yeah, multiply what by what? What should I multiply? Assuming it's like a matrix, it's B, do B times A. Okay, yeah, do B times A. Do, do that yellow matrix there multiplied by A on the other side. So when I have A over here, 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, then I'll put this matrix over here, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. 
So we'll do out this matrix product. What dimension is this product going to have? Three by three, no longer two by two. Now, if we were really on top of our linear algebra game, we could already make an argument for why we know this is not going to work. Um, the argument for why we know this is not going to work is that the rank of a product of two matrices cannot be any greater than the number of linearly independent columns or rows in either one of those matrices. Sometimes I speak in paragraphs. Um, what I mean by that is that the fact that we were able to get a two by two identity matrix out of this means that we cannot get any more than two linearly independent columns in the product of this matrix is going the other way. But an identity matrix has to have, well, what's the dimensions of this identity matrix going to be? Three by three. So we would have to have three linearly independent columns there, and we know it's not going to happen. That's the sophisticated argument. But since we have a specific candidate for the left pseudo inverse, let's just multiply it out and see. First row with first column gives me a one. Actually, so far, so good. First row with the second column. One times minus one plus zero times one. Uh-oh. Already we're sunk. And we can do the rest of it if you want to. So there's a context that you've already seen in which right inverses are not necessarily always left inverses. Um, the problem for us in abstract algebra is that these matrices that have different dimensions, for the most part, they live in different universes from one another, as far as we're going to be concerned. Um, because what we're going to be looking for are structures that are self-contained, self-consistent. Right? Uh, so if, my, if I'm thinking of a 2 by 3 matrix as being my object that I'm studying, I want everything else that I combine it with to also be 2 by 3 matrices. Right? I want all my elements to have something in common with one another that lets me combine any two of them together. But I can't multiply a 2 by 3 matrix by another 2 by 3 matrix. In linear algebra, we have to change the dimensions around in order to do any of this kind of stuff. Um, and so it's, a ch I think, an even bigger challenge now that we've found one example in which left inverses and right inverses don't agree, can we find an example of a different mathematical structure that in which we can multiply anything by anything that we want to, but in which right inverses and left inverses aren't the same? Maybe we can, maybe we can't, but I'm going to leave that unresolved for now.